Welcome to Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our website is libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today we're with Ralph Rossum discussing the jurisprudence of Clarence Thomas. Ralph Rossum is the Henry Salvatore Professor of Political Philosophy and American Constitutionalism at Claremont McKenna College. He is also the author of numerous books, including most recently, The Supreme Court and Tribal Gaming, California versus the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. He's the author of Antonin Scalia's Jurisprudence, Text and Tradition. Also, Federalism, The Supreme Court and the 17th Amendment, The Irony of Constitutional Democracy. And he's currently at work on a book entitled The Jurisprudence of Clarence Thomas, Constitutional Restoration. Ralph, welcome to Liberty Law Talk. It's my pleasure to be with you. Ralph, before we get into Thomas's jurisprudence and, and really looking at the, the meat and the analysis of his opinions, I do, wanted, uh, I do want to spend some time just thinking about him as the, a man uh, and who he is philosophically. Uh, it seems to me his autobiography was extremely well-received received a lot of attention and, and showed us a part of his you know, tremendous character. I think it's, it's uh, safe to say, and also his biography as well, uh, a, an impressive man. But let me ask you this, this general question. Um, something known about Thomas is that he has his clerks read the, the Fountainhead, his Supreme Court clerks, as, as something to consider prior to starting the term. Uh, we also know that there was a natural law element in his earlier scholarly writings prior to uh, getting on the court. Uh, and that this is also kind of a unique part of his jurisprudence, which we'll get into. Um, there's also this part of Thomas, Ken Foskett, I think, describes it very well in his book, Judging Thomas, where he says Thomas, the best way to understand him is that he is a fiercely independent thinker uh, whose supreme principle is a refusal to be told what to think or what to conform to or what he should uh, actually uh, do, uh, given uh, X, Y, Z categories. Is this part of Thomas something, is this part of Thomas on the court uh, or even earlier at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission? Well, I think uh, if you read his uh, uh, memoir, My uh, Grandfather's Son, uh, that kind of fierce independence and doing it his way uh, it characterizes his uh, uh, life uh, from uh, the, uh, his earliest years. Uh, his uh, grandfather had an enormous influence on him. Uh, he was a, a very devout uh, Catholic, a very devout uh, um, man of God, fiercely independent, not worn down by the uh, racism and uh, Jim Crow laws and segregation of uh, pinpoint uh, Georgia in the uh, in the 50s. Uh, a remarkable man. Uh, in many ways, I think Thomas has attempted to model his life on that of his grandfather and carry on that independence. He lost his faith for a while, but has regained it, so the deep uh, uh, religious faith uh, of his uh, grandfather. And uh, doing it his own way, one great example of doing it his own way, of course, is feeling no obligation whatsoever to ask questions during oral argument. Uh, Much criticized by his silence, uh, much derided by some as... uh, uh, because of the silence, c- claiming that it's because he has nothing to ask, that he's an empty uh, suit, or in this case, an empty robe, uh, when, uh, uh, according to the clerks that, uh, of his that I've uh, discussed this with, no one prepares for oral argument more than he. But what he's interested in doing, in preparing for or- oral argument, is not to ask the questions himself, but to see how the questioning goes, learn from that, and then, most importantly, determine the direction that the law will take if the court rules one way or another in a particular case. That's what matters for him, the direction of the law, not the acclaim or attention he gets for asking or not asking questions. Uh, let me ask you this uh, as well, in, in thinking about uh, Thomas's uh, moving into his jurisprudence specifically. What is the example, you think, or what's he really, what does he think, uh, the natural law or, or natural right principle? Uh, because he, he's written about this prior to, he was criticized for it in his confirmation hearings. How does, this, how does he see that playing a part in American constitutionalism? Well, he makes uh, the argument uh, that uh, 
the declaration of the, the intent of the framers, the fundamental purpose of the framers in drafting the Constitution was to fulfill the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, it is uh, for him, he argues that the Declaration is foundational to the Constitution, that it both precedes and also underlies the Constitution. And uh, uh, so for him, uh, you turn first to the notion of natural rights, the equality of man, uh, the uh, rights that we receive based on that equality, because no man is uh, greater or superior to any other man. No one by nature has the right to take our life, liberty, or uh, property. Uh, and that is uh, core and central to, uh, uh, to his jurisprudence. Uh, he says if you don't take the Declaration uh, seriously, uh, if you don't consider the constitutional logical extension of the Declaration, important parts of the Constitution become, as he says, inexplicable. And, of course, the Equal Protection Clause would be part of that, and therefore Thomas's uh, total commitment to a colorblind Constitution, total rejection of affirmative action or ameliorative racial preference, because he says whether uh, one is treated differently on the basis of race because you want to help that person or you want to harm that person, it's still doing it on the basis of race, a category uh, inconsistent uh, with the uh, equality claims of the Declaration. And building on this, it, you know, it seems, uh, this seems important to me. So when I think of Thomas's jurisprudence, you, know, you always situate him, or I tend to situate him within kind of the line of, of the great originalist, of you know, chief, the former Chief Justice William Rehnquist, also of Robert Bork. Uh, uh, obviously, Antonin Scalia, who sits with him currently, and thinking of ways that that he's different, uh, that differentiates him. And it seems, thinking about originalism, um, one criticism of it would be that it is really just positivism, uh, and that is really the central thing it is it is aiming at. Uh, but yet, Thomas seems to bring in something else. Uh, and, and but also, we know with Thomas, his originalism. Uh, he's much more willing to question precedent, to question tradition, as opposed to other originalists. Um, and it seems the Declaration is a part of that. But also, apart from the Declaration, he also seems to suggest there's, there's a political theory behind the Constitution uh, that we have to incorporate. Am, am I correct in thinking that? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, speaking of precedent, uh, you mentioned Ken Foskett's uh, book, uh, Judging Thomas, and he quotes uh, Justice Scalia in the book as saying, no one hates precedent more than uh, Thomas. No one is, uh, th th that Scalia often is willing to de depart from precedent, but not with the regularity or the uh, firm commitment to getting things right uh, of Justice uh, Thomas. Um, yeah, the, for, for Thomas, the understanding, the intent of the uh, framers uh, is critical in a way that it wasn't either to, to Rehnquist, uh, I would say to Bork, or to uh, uh, Justice Scalia. In fact, uh, with the assistance of Gregory Maggs at uh, George Washington Law School, I've been able, in the work I'm doing so far on Thomas, to suggest that there are really three different kinds of originalism. Um, and Thomas, in his own jurisprudence, combines all three aspects. Most others don't. One kind of originalism would be original intent. Original intent trying to ascertain the intentions of those who drafted the document, who drafted the Constitution. Uh, what were they attempting to do? Uh, what uh, were, were they up to? What were the ends they wanted to achieve? The means they employed to achieve those, those ends, etc. And if you do that kind of originalism, you're going to focus primarily on the records of the Federal Convention, the uh, notes uh, and letters of, of those who attended that convention. You're looking at it from the point of view of the framers. There's another kind of originalism, uh, and it often goes by the name original understanding. And that would be to uh, attempt to ascertain how the Constitution was understood by those in the state ratifying conventions that actually took a document that was merely a piece of paper and gave it life, made it uh, our ratified constitution. And 
those who focus on original understanding uh, look at what was going on, the debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, uh, the uh, debates within the ratifying conventions themselves. Uh, typically included in this would be the work of the first Congress, which had to take the bare-bones Constitution and make a government out of it. Uh, uh, so many of the, the framers and ratifiers were present in that, that first Congress. So it focuses on those kinds of documents. There's a third kind of originalism, and this is Justice Scalia's form of originalism, and it's often referred to as original public meaning. What did the words mean to the society that adopted them? Not trying to figure out what was in Madison's head or the, in the heads of any of the ratifiers, but simply what did the words at the time mean? Uh, Scalia did a book called A Matter of Interpretation, and in that book he says, I will consult the writings of some who happen to be delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Hamilton's and Madison's writings in the Federalist, for example. I do so, however, not because they were framers, and therefore their intent is authoritative and must be law, but rather because their writings, like, uh, like those of other and intelligent and informed people at the time, display how the text of the Constitution was originally understood. He wants to uh, know what the original meaning of the text was, Tom, Scalia rejects the use of legislative history, uh, turning to the process of making the law or making the Constitution. He never cites the, the records of the Federal Convention, never gets into the ratifying debates, Jonathan uh, Elliott's uh, debates. Uh, he, if he does, it's only to explain what words meant, not what was informing the thinking of those uh, who, who drafted and ratified the Constitution. Thomas is uh, a, an interesting originalist in that he combines all three flavors of originalism in what I'm calling his general, original, general meaning approach. He will turn to the text and to the uh, original public meaning of the words when that's appropriate, but he uh, strengthens his argument by then turning to what went on in the convention, went one on in ratifying conventions, uh, what was being done contemporaneously. I just actually was reading an opinion by Thomas yes yesterday. It's called Helling Against uh, McKinney, and it has to do with the Eighth Amendment, the meaning of cruel and unusual punishment. For the first 185 years of our history, uh, cruel and unusual punishments pertained merely or simply to the sentence the kind of sentence that's imposed on um, a convicted offender. And it had nothing to do with conditions of confinement, how harsh life was in prison, etc. In 1976, in Estelle against uh, uh, Gable, Gamble, uh, the Supreme Court uh, said the Eighth Amendment applies to conditions of confinement as well. And in this 92 dissent by uh, Thomas, he begins by first saying, when the Eighth Amendment was ratified, the word punishment referred to a penalty imposed for the commission of crime. And he cites seven dictionaries. And then he goes on and says, as far as I know, there is no historical evidence indicating that the framers or ratifiers of the Eighth Amendment had anything other in mind than this common understanding of punishment. And then he goes on and uses Eliot's debates to uh, support his point and Story's commentaries. And then, this is wonderful, he said, as of 1792, the Delaware Constitution's analog to the Eighth Amendment provided that, quote, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted, which is the words of the Eighth Amendment. And then, in addition, and in the construction of jails, a proper regard shall be had to the health of the inmates. And so, as Thomas said, this provision suggests that when the members of a founding generation wished to make prison conditions a matter of constitutional guarantee, they knew how to do it. They wrote it in. They didn't assume that somehow it was included under the general term of cruel and unusual punishments. So Thomas, uh, uh, Scalia would never argue this way. Scalia would find m most of this unacceptable use of legislative history. And um, Thomas, in a sense, by... Uh, 
casting his net more broadly or, or, or opening the originalist focus of his analysis to include um, not simply what the words mean, but the intent of the framers and the understanding of the ratifiers uh, makes, in my estimation, often a much more compelling uh, point in support of uh, the conclusions he wants to reach than, than Scalia. Scalia is wonderful, uh, but in many respects, Thomas is deeper and, and broader. And while he might not write with the same panache and verve of Scalia, uh, he is a good writer. I'm, I'm, I will grant him that. Uh, he nonetheless, at the end of the day, probably makes more of an impact uh, by his more uh, comprehensive originalism. Let me ask you this. I mean, I, you know, reading Matter of Interpretation at the time, you know, I, I always understood Scalia to be referring to the interpretation of statutes with regard to legislative history, which made sense to me, particularly if we consider, you know, the work of public choice or rational choice scholars that, you know, what's really yeah. behind a lot of legislation is not what they're, you know, saying in the well of the Senate or on the floor of the House or in committee meetings. Uh, it's these other interests that are at play. Uh, and if that was true, I always thought what Scalia had to say, you know, made sense, not to mention kind of the you know, pulling together or collating a lot of different voices to trying to discern something, that analysis seemed to open you up uh, to any interpretation you want or the, you know, to allow a judge to incorporate a policy preference if that was his, you know, primary methodology. And yet, uh, in this regard, it, it does seem it is, you know, interpreting constitutional text and, and you're going to have an original meaning. And you, as Scalia said, um, you know, there, there's no primary look uh, that he's going to make into convention debates, you know, either that of Madison's notes, uh, you know, that what's been compiled by Max Ferrand, or et cetera. But yet, um, I wonder too. You mentioned one opinion, uh, but it, it seems also uh, in, in the you know now infamous landmark opinion, District of Columbia you know, versus Heller, that uh, if I remember, Justice John Paul Stevens had a concurring opinion. Um, noting uh, dissenting opinion. Uh, a dissenting opinion. Sorry, noting ratification history behind. Uh, the Second Amendment, uh, and that where it was, you know, this debate would it come at the end of the document or be interwoven in the text. Um, he made a he, he made a claim that where it actually was going to be placed by Madison showed that it was a corporate right because it was merely a concern for federal government having control over militias and so trying to hedge against that. And uh, Scalia, of course, there's no there's no reply in his opinion. I think because of this problem that you outlined. Uh, I was uh, privileged uh, in the summer of 1987 to. Uh, team teach a course with uh, Justice Scalia on the American founding at the University of Aix-Marseille Law School in Aix-en-Provence. Not a bad way to spend uh, late June and early July of that, uh, of that year. Um, and I was invited to team teach the course because Scalia had been asked to teach it, and he said, I've never read the records. And so uh, they wanted somebody who knew the records well, and uh, so Louisiana State University, which was organizing this uh, the law center there called me and asked if I wanted to team teach. I thought, here's my chance to teach the records to Scalia. And for a long time, I was so disappointed, uh, a long time after teaching that, so disappointed because Scalia never used all the great stuff I was introducing him to. And it was only when I got uh, seriously under work on the book on Scalia that I understood why. It wasn't that I hadn't been effective in presenting this material. It's simply that he considers it inappropriate to use. Uh, uh, and, and clearly, unlike Thomas, Thomas is always in the records, in the uh, documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, in the annals, uh, the early annals of Congress. Um, Thomas is uh, a user of founding documents like none other. Let me ask you this question. In thinking of you know the you know, the primary concerns of uh, of a lot of uh, conservatives regarding uh, the commerce clause and also federalism, uh, how does Thomas's approach here? I mean, just kind of sketch for us what what sort of uh, uh, analysis it opens him up to. Well, um, on on the commerce clause, uh, the first big commerce clause case for Thomas upon um, confirmation to serve on the court was the Guns Free School Zone Act case uh, in uh, 1995. Um, and uh, the question here was whether Congress, under its Commerce Clause power, had power to ban uh, the presence of a gun within 500 feet of a school zone. And 
a five-member majority for the first time in a generation struck down an act by Congress as exceeding its authority under the Commerce Clause. Uh, the majority of opinion was written by Rehnquist. Thomas writes an important concurrence. And he joins Rehnquist's opinion, but he says uh, this case ought to encourage us at the appropriate time to take up a case to reconsider all of our precedents since the New Deal in the area of the Commerce Clause. The court had come to employ what was referred to as a substantial effects test. Anything that uh, substantially affected interstate commerce was subject to congressional regulation. And that substantial effects test became so malleable and so expansive that Justice Breyer, writing for the four dissenters in Lopez, said, made the following argument. If there are guns in school, kids get nervous. If kids get nervous, they don't learn as much. If they don't learn as much, they're not going to get as good a job as they might otherwise get. If they don't have a good job, they're not going to have money to buy stuff in interstate commerce. Therefore, Congress can regulate it. And uh, Thomas's concurrence said this kind of reasoning allows the federal government basically to have a comprehensive police power, the power to do and regulate and legislate on anything. Um, and uh, by so doing, it totally alters the federal structure. Instead of the federal government being one of delegated powers and the state's governments of reserved powers, the federal government would have all the same reserved powers as the states. And he also goes on and says, it makes no sense. If you interpret commerce so comprehensively, it effectively renders superfluous every other provision in Article I, Section 8, the, the, the section granting uh, delegating powers to the federal government. Uh, you surely wouldn't need uh, the power to create post offices and post roads, because that obviously has a substantial effect on commerce. Uh, so uh, Thomas uh, recommended to the court that they seek a case where they could rethink Commerce Clause jurisprudence. And in subsequent cases, Thomas has become uh, more uh, vigilant, more committed uh, to reversing uh, what he sees as a whole string of very bad decisions on the Commerce Clause. Thinking, I uh, uh, just wanted to read briefly uh, uh, part of Thomas's opinion in Lopez. The power to regulate commerce can by no means encompass authority over mere gun possession, any more than it empowers the federal government to regulate marriage, littering, or cruelty to animals throughout the 50 states. Our Constitution, quite properly, leaves such matters to the individual states, notwithstanding these activities' effects on interstate commerce. Any interpretation of the Commerce Clause that even suggests that Congress could regulate such matters is in need of re-examination. Uh, end quote. One of the things that Thomas is uh, writing here reminds me of is a letter uh, from Thomas Jefferson to James Madison on uh, necessary and proper uh, clause. And, and Jefferson made the statement to Madison that, you know, the, the analysis can easily lead to a piling on of inference upon inference uh, such that, you know, what is pat patently unconstitutional suddenly becomes constitutional in order to reach, uh, you know, the, the general effect uh, within, you know, an expansive interpretation uh, uh, and, and as such, the federal government has unlimited power, and this is what Thomas is pointing to. Exactly, exactly. Uh, in that respect, uh, Thomas does harken back to uh, Madison's concerns in the first Congress concerning the constitutionality of the Bank Act and uh, a number of uh, uh, letters that Jefferson wrote uh, concerned about uh, uh, the, the, the power of Congress to issue charters of incorporation for the mining of copper necessary for the U.S. Navy. Uh, and uh, uh, at least those things actually have to do with other delegated powers, um, unlike uh, the, the Guns Free School Zone Act, uh, which has to do only with the possession of a gun. That gun could have been made in the state of Texas. Uh, Lopez is a Texas-based case. That gun could never have been in interstate commerce at all, and yet four members of the court were perfectly willing to say uh, 
that the uh, unease in schools that the presence of a gun might uh, generate uh, is sufficient for Congress to regulate it. Uh, now, clearly, uh, Thomas's opinions in Lopez, in the medical marijuana case, uh, Gonzalez against Raich, uh, give a pretty good indication of where he'll be coming out uh, concerning the constitutionality of uh, the individual mandate in Obamacare. Uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, thinking about Thomas's ruling out of, of substantial effects um, as being a part of the analysis, but yet there is something to be said. It seems the Commerce Clause and the theory behind it is to open up the nation for trade, uh, uh, you know, for commerce. Um, how then are states to regulate trade, it seems, and to be concerned of matters within their own borders if you have national corporations, uh, high-level vertical integration of companies, uh, their ability to reach not you know, nationally but globally, uh, and, and interstate commerce being so broad, you could easily see a situation, as was complained of uh, early in the 20th century, particularly by you know, progressive jurisprudence, uh, that, that somehow this type of a Commerce Clause analysis, if it didn't take into account these types of effects, the states would really be left with nothing to do. I, I would argue that this, in a sense, uh, touches on an, an important part of, of Thomas's Commerce Clause jurisprudence, and that's something called the dormant or the negative Commerce Clause. And um, it has become conventional wisdom that even though Article 1, Section 8 says Congress shall have power to regulate commerce among the several states. The courts have come to understand that even in the absence of congressional legislation actually regulating interstate commerce, if states pass laws that favor their own internal commerce or their goods or manufacturers over uh, out-of-state goods and manufacturing, that that discrimination burdens interstate commerce that the purpose of uh, the Commerce Clause was to create an uh, open common market free from barriers. And even when the Congress hasn't acted, the court is free to step in and use the Commerce Clause to invalidate these state barriers. Uh, the two justices on the court most opposed to the legitimacy of this negative Commerce Clause jurisprudence are Scalia and, and Thomas. Thomas came to it later than Scalia. In fact, Thomas initially wrote several opinions employing uh, the negative commerce clause or regretting that it hadn't been employed where he thought it should have. But then he had an epiphany in a case called Camp's Newfound Oatana against Town of Harrison, um, where uh, uh, he uh, joins Scalia in arguing that uh, the negative commerce clause is not textually based, is an illegitimate power that the court has exercised is nothing but a means by which the court can engage in policy making uh, that should be left to the Congress or to the states themselves and um, uh, has turned his back on the negative commerce clause ever since and he's done it in a way more dramatically uh, than uh, uh, Scalia. Scalia in one opinion said I, I deny the legitimacy of the com uh, negative commerce clause, and I will refuse to join any opinion that extends it further than it's already been extended. Thomas has said uh, it's illegitimate, and I will vote against its employment now and forever, and has uh, uh, succe uh, successfully, consistently done so. Uh, he also did one thing that Scalia didn't do, and this is a difference in their jurisprudence as well. Scalia is often content to say, this is wrong. Uh, Thomas uh, will f conclude that something is wrong, but then often, given the fact that he has this general uh, meaning approach, original general meaning approach, he's drawing on a variety of sources that Scalia doesn't, Thomas, in the case of the negative Commerce Clause, pointed out that if states behave too badly, there is the import-export clause that could be employed. Um, Scalia, uh, Thomas, for the most part, wants Congress to pass legislation to prevent excessive regulation or discrimination by states in interstate commerce. But if uh, the Congress uh, doesn't act in especially egregious examples or Ill, uh, instances, 
Thomas has suggested that the negative that the import export clause is available. The import export clause has more or less been understood by the court for about a hundred years to apply only to foreign commerce. And in his uh, dissent in Campso Atana, uh, Thomas uh, spends many pages reviewing that history and concluding that the original understanding of the import export clause was that it applied both to foreign and interstate commerce, and that that old original understanding ought to be brought back uh, into play. You mentioned Thomas's willingness, I think, not just to note a wrong, but to correct it from the bench. Yeah, but this is interesting also from the Raish opinion, which uh, figured so strongly uh, in you know, the recent opinion by the D.C. Circuit Court, I think it was, uh, on, on the Patient Care uh, and Affordable Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, where uh, Lawrence Silberman alluded to Raich and, and also to uh, Wickard versus Filburn has precedents establishing uh, the authority yeah. for Obamacare. And, and I thought, you know, as I'm reading that, I'm thinking of you know, Scalia's kind of prudence to let settled tradition go. Uh, also, maybe Scalia is aware that you know, the court, uh, while it has the power, may not want to exercise it, may want that to be reclaimed through, through the representative branches. Uh, but I, that, that really uh, was strong, I think, in, in reading that opinion. Also, it, it seems um, as well, not just with the Commerce Clause, uh, and of course, you know, Thomas being willing to, to let the chips fall where they may, but also with, with federalism itself. Thomas has indicated in several speeches uh, that he believes the court has you know, uh, all authority, due authority to protect federalism in the same manner as it protects rights, individual rights under the Bill of Rights. Um, but of course, you know, you know, just alluding to Publius, uh, uh, I think it was Federalist 43, with the idea of liquidating the meaning of the Constitution, that certain clauses of the Constitution were not yet, there was no meaning uh, readily uh, available to us uh, in, in, in a a clear format, but yet these things had to be uh, liquidated through public debate, uh, through, uh, you know, the force of time, uh, historical change, et cetera. People would have to constantly evaluate it in light of the written constitution. Is Thomas here, in thinking about federalism and the Commerce Clause, is he on proper footing, do you think, to make these kind of bold claims? Uh, in, in what I've written uh, to date on Thomas, um, and uh, by the way, uh, I have a, a law review article coming out. It's in the uh, University of Detroit Mercy Law Review, uh, volume 88, number four. Um, it should be out in a, in a month. It's a 59-page uh, law review article that I, I wrote on the Commerce Clause. Uh, University of Mercy Law School, uh, Detroit Mercy Law School, held a symposium last uh, late February. Uh, commemorating 20 years of Thomas on the uh, Supreme Court. And so I was invited to, to write a paper for that, that conference. In, in that paper and what I've written in the book so far, I praise Thomas for his negative commerce clause jurisprudence uh, and uh, criticize him to some degree for his uh, defense of federalism uh, on the ground that he is an originalist and should take account of the fact that the uh, way the framers intended for the interest of states as states to be secured, um, for the federal government to be held in check, was the mode of electing the Senate. Originally, the Senate was elected by state legislatures. Uh, there's ample evidence from the founding era that the view was that those who were sent to Washington as senators to, to the nation's capital as senators were effectively ambassadors from their state and were there to ensure that state interests were uh, preserved, the inviolable and residuary sovereignty of the states maintained, to use that language from Federalist 39. And um, it worked quite effectively. Marshall can be quite uh, deferential to the Congress's use of power because he knows that the Senate will be vigilant and not pass measures that trench on state sovereignty because these individuals will have to go home and stand for re-election, appear before members of their state legislative committees and explain why they were taking away power from the states and transferring it to the remote federal government. That remedy really worked quite, or that protection worked quite well. Um, 
but eventually the public's desire for democracy uh, overcame their interest in preserving federalism, and we ended up with the 17th Amendment. And uh, in a post-17th Amendment era, we don't have the institutional means of protecting uh, state sovereignty in a way that we had prior to that point. And uh, Thomas somehow believes that it's appropriate for the court to step in and try to do what the court was not originally intended to do, uh, to uh, compensate for the removal of uh, an effective structural uh, feature. And uh, there's no evidence that uh, uh, the court is particularly good at protecting federalism. For the most part, it uh, depends on the mustering of the occasional five-member majority who will strike down some federal intrusion on, on the states. Uh, it's, it's not uh, very democratic, and it certainly isn't very uh, structural or consistent. And so uh, I, I fault Thomas for not uh, uh, understanding that uh, there's something ironic about attempting to preserve uh, the original kind of federalism uh, by a means that was never intended uh, as the means of doing so. Now, the 17th Amendment... Uh is an interesting uh, event also it you know, seems also I mean the entire kind of scope of the progressive amendments that come about to uh, work, work a lot of change uh, it seems I mean this is interesting because the courts do it seems in the 19th century uh, I think protect the integrity of the Commerce Clause uh, and and this is you know largely done away with uh, several important cases in the New Deal but also one one could make the case it seems that you know, maybe it's it's the special interest of Congress that will make it quite difficult to uh, to r- regulate uh, a lot of, and to you know as as it were prevent the states from doing a lot of things that trip up commerce. And you actually want to have a clear and efficient mechanism uh, uh, to preserve the kind of the open common market you were referring to, and that would be that would be the Supreme Court being able to do that and not having a lot of the states as states trying to uh, you know get their regulatory and fiscal surplus, as it were. Uh, that, I mean, that's, you've, you've raised an interesting point, though. Uh, let me ask you, kind of as we, as we conclude, going forward, um, is, has Thomas given us any indication of, I mean, you've, you know, we've talked about kind of the progression of his Commerce Clause jurisprudence, jurisprudence being more and more daring. Are there other parts of, uh, of his uh, you know, you know, jurisprudence that are kind of being developed or, or that are, are coming out into sharper focus? I, I guess I am... Uh struck as I read op- opinions across different uh, areas of uh, the law, how consistent he is in his approach, how he turns to the same kinds of materials, he asks the same kinds of questions, uh, he pursues the same kind of uh, uh, methodology. And uh, th- I'm, when, when you look at uh, establishment of religion cases, uh, when you look at free speech cases, when you look at commercial speech, uh, Thomas is invariably back in the late 18th century going through the documents to find out what the original meaning of the words, original intent of those who drafted it, original understanding of those who ratified those, those uh, documents, uh, what, what those things mean. He is, uh, he's got a well-thought-out uh, uh, methodology. Uh, he will go with the conventional wisdom until he's had a chance in, in a particular case to really think it through. And once there is this big case where he can uh, put his uh, active mind and that of his uh, law clerks together working on thinking something through, once he's thought it through, he sticks with it. He then just cites his previous opinions and joins in concurrences or, or brief dissents. Uh, once he's thought it through, that's it. Uh, it. What is interesting is the number of instances where he does change his mind. He comes in like a conventional justice, and then there, there's this epiphany. Uh, he sees things through for the first time to his satisfaction, and then he moves on, and uh, uh, moves on consistent with that new insight or understanding he's uh, developed. And uh, uh, that's uh, fairly distinctive among the justices, as far as I can tell. Let me ask you this, moving uh, away from his jurisprudence. Why now uh, do you think is there this kind of reconsideration of, 
of Thomas's uh, time on the bench because you know we've had there was a recent piece in the New York Times, uh, there was another a longer piece in the New Yorker, uh, places you wouldn't expect to see uh, a, an appreciative look at Thomas. Um, you know, I recall a lot of anecdotal evidence, both uh, as a summer associate at a large firm and also in law school. Uh, when Clarence Thomas came to speak at my law school, um, you know, six professors wouldn't even teach that day. Uh, and then other, other students yeah. protested. Uh, I mean, it was just, it was a truly shameful thing. Um, uh, and, and I remember hearing lawyers, you know, put down Clarence Thomas, is, is, and particularly making sure they, they, you know, insulted his intelligence. And yet there's this reconsideration going on. Your book is going to be a huge part of that. Wh- why do you think this is? Well... Uh, first of all, the uh, initial criticisms were so over the top. Um, the, the Harvard Law Review had a, a piece uh, early on uh, in Thomas's tenure where uh, the argument was the only thing that motivated Thomas was rendering decisions uh, completely opposite to those taken by his predecessor in that seat, Thurgood Marshall. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of ludicrous uh, charges against him uh, were uh, so transparently uh, false that it, it didn't take a really great work product on his part to uh, show that uh, that, that was uh, hyperbolic rhetoric. But then they started actually reading his opinions and realized that there is a solid craftsman uh, at, at work here uh, who is doing it his way and is winning converts. Uh, some evidence has come out about how it's not Scalia. Uh, Thomas isn't the a lawn jockey for Scalia, but in some instances, Scalia is the lawn jockey uh, of, uh, of Thomas because Thomas has done the heavy work. Thomas has brought Scalia around to his thinking, not the other way around. Uh, I did a review of all of the law review articles written by Thomas since coming on the bench. And for the, about the first 10 years, they're almost unrelievedly hostile. And during the second decade of his service on the court, there's been a substantial um, mood change. Uh, he is taken seriously. Uh, positive pieces are being uh, written. Uh, there is a... Uh, a woman at the University of Iowa Law School who describes herself as a black liberal womanist. And she wrote this very long and quite positive piece on Thomas. And she admitted early in the piece that she was doing something she never imagined she would ever do, and that was defend Clarence Thomas. And um, uh, this is happening uh, more and more. Uh, the uh, very, uh, I think it's fair to call him uh, Marxist, uh, Mark Tushnet, uh, has written a very positive piece about Thomas and his race decisions. Um, uh, so there's, there's a real transformation in the law school literature, and as those articles get read by journalists, columnists, who uh, write the shorter or more popular pieces, I think they're going to continue, we're going to continue to see uh, an uptick in uh, Thomas's uh, reputation and, uh, and regard. Ralph, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so glad you were here with us today. It's been my pleasure. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org.